Ricardo, thanks for joining me today. Now, I'd like to start by just outlining for those who aren't so familiar why Phase 4 studies are required and, and really what the purpose of them is, if you could just share some information on that. Uh, so typically, the Phase 4 study are viewed <clears throat> as um, a very needed complementing set of um, clinical activities that take place after a drug has been approved. And the reason why they're developed is either to respond to potential comparative effectiveness uh, versus new entry in the marketplace. So they use usually to compare and contrast efficacy and safety versus comparators molecules that for the very same indication they were not either available during development or were not needed during development. But they also have additional needs. So for instance, they could be used to expand the, the so-called label. So any drug at the time of licensing is uh, licensed on a certain indication. So within the same indication, there could be an extension. So for instance, a drug that could be used for diabetes not necessarily could be used in a pediatric population. So for instance, that oftentimes is a phase four type of question, so it's supported by a phase four type of uh, study. In addition, one could look for a different indication. So a medication that has been licensed for a certain indication could be explored for a new, totally different and unforeseen indication at the time of development. So quite broad the potential um, area on which phase four study could support a drug that has been already approved. Okay, so it's supporting or potentially expanding the role of the drug on the market. Correct. And if we look at how the phase four studies are conducted, how do they differ to perhaps the large scale pre-registration phase three studies when you look at scale, when you look at endpoints and how they're conducted? Well, so the, the phase three study really are uh, designed to um, meet the expectation of regulatory authorities. So in terms of uh, clinical study design and point size of the study are very much similar drug to drug within the same given class. Now, any new drug that gets in the marketplace needs to differentiate itself. So phase three study are typically aiming at proving safety and efficacy. Phase four study, especially if they're not for a first in class, but also if they're first in class for indication where there are alternatives, need to become a little bit more creative. So for instance, the endpoints of a typical diabetes study is HbA1c. The endpoint for an LDL cholesterol lowering drug is LDL cholesterol. Now, the phase four study could be more creative. There could be LDL cholesterol without the side effect that you may observe in association with statin. Or there could be glucose lowering with less incidence of hypoglycemia. So the phase four in terms of design and endpoints trying to meet the requirements in the marketplace, which are a little bit more sophisticated than the essential, purely scientific requirement of the registration goals. Okay. And phase four studies can be conducted either as randomized control studies, I guess, like phase three, or they can be observational studies. So how do you determine which is the more appropriate route? Yeah, so I think the gold standard of scientific, scientific evidence remains the randomized control study, because typically speaking, in a randomized control study, you will allocate patients to different treatment options independently from the characteristics of the patient. So the outcome of the study supposedly is driven exclusively by the drug and not by any bias selection. Okay. 
In reality, in randomized control study, you really create an artificial situation by which patients are actually very aggressively monitored to favor compliance. While in real life, compliance is governed by things that go beyond the pure efficacy. So for instance, a drug that needs to be taken three times a day is associated, typically speaking, with something that in terms of compliance is less favorable than a drug that needs to be taken once a week. Of course. However, in a randomized control study, this difference would disappear if they have the same potency and efficacy. However, in real life, so in an observational study, you may see something that is not artificial, actually is closer to the real life use. So the observational study introduced, or at least aimed at introducing, a little bit more the potential drivers to success and failure that in real world practice we see. So I guess as well as you mentioned earlier, comparing to perhaps different comparators, from what you're saying there, the phase four studies can actually provide additional information that wouldn't necessarily be captured during the pre-registration trials. So to, to nowadays, um, almost any company developing molecule and, uh, and designing their phase three study, they try to make them robust enough to minimize the need of phase four. In reality, this is quite impossible because you can only do phase three study with the comparator that are available at the time you're designing them. So if, if any other of the tens of companies that are looking at the same type of disease are developing new compound while you're developing your phase, phase three, you will not be able to do the study at the same time, so that's why you need to postpone the study. So there will always be a need of a phase four, uh, just because the timing will not be ideal to match the, the next entry into the marketplace. Okay, and the, the, the planning process for phase three is obviously some number of years before the registration process and launch, but you know, looking at the phase four studies, at what point in the development cycle does planning normally start for these? Well, I would say that at least a couple of years before filing for registration, one starts thinking about what will need to be integrated, because during the development, maybe uh, there is the possibility of learning on new molecules that likely will entry at the same time or maybe slightly sooner or slightly later, but would be still not appropriate to include them in the development. So what you do, um, you kind of make a compromise. Your first objective becomes filing. Your secondary objective will be to um, make your value proposition stronger by complementing what you have already generating with new study that will explore aspects that were not possible to be explored during development. And this needs to start being planned at least a couple of years before. And from your experience, because you've worked on a number of phase four studies or, or planning a number of phase four studies, what are the key things that need to be factored in and what are the common pitfalls to avoid with these studies? Well, so uh, obviously the phase four are more risky study because they need to be a little bit more creative. They need to address the challenges that any drug has in the marketplace. And, and so there is a little bit more assumption that needs to be generated at the time of study design on your possibility to be better than comparator. So the risk is that you may not have learned enough about your drug at the time you design your phase four. And oftentimes what's, um, what is the most likely risk is to encounter a subpopulation of individuals that may have a different response. And if you have not characterized this during your development, you may, uh, in the design of the phase four, 
skew the study design in a non-favorable way just because you neglected to characterize what are the plus and minuses during development. Okay. And it, one thing that, that occurs to me is that increasingly it seems like these post-approval studies can play an important role in market access with regards to drugs. Mm -hmm. So are there particular examples you would quote of phase four studies that really have helped, I guess, redefine the market position for a drug or improved access to it? Well, I mean, certainly the statins are an example of drug that um, not only lower LDL, but they can promote, uh, can reduce cardiovascular mortality. So no LDL lowering agent will ever be successful if it doesn't produce cardiovascular benefit data. And those typically early on they were done as a phase four study. Today, from a regulatory point of view, if someone will come up with a new study, it's unclear whether, whether it's mandated because LDL is considered a good surrogate, so you could design a phase three study, set of study for a new drug purely on LDL lowering. However, okay. you will need to compete into a marketplace where the, the competitors have shown that in addition to lowering LDL, you improve uh, cardiovascular benefit. So uh, the, the statins have created a precedent where in addition to changing a biomarker called LDL, you actually improve um, on mortality. So that has significantly changed the opportunities for this class. And so within that whole area, there must have been quite a volume of phase four study activity. Exactly, but, but interestingly, had a spillover on any other lipid modifier, so any other sure. agent attempt to reduce risk factor even if it's not acting on LDL and even if it's not required from the regulatory point of view, will likely need to include this study either as a phase four or as a phase three slash phase. So sometimes there are studies that starts prior to registration, prior to approval. They're not completed at the time the drug is filed. So some people call them phase 3B, phase 4, because they start when the drug is not yet approved and they continue within the uh, life phase of, uh, of the drug on the market. Okay. So just as a final question, based on what you described there, clearly phase 4 studies are very important commercially as well. So. Where do you think phase four study planning and operation should really sit within big pharma to be the most effective? Well, so typically those should be in medical affairs because what, uh, what they attempt to do is to really respond to uh, the complexity of options in the uh, real life arena of alternatives. So they really need to be harmonized with the commercial value proposition. Um, so they're not purely R&D, they're not only addressing scientific questions. Of course, they're starting from a scientific question, but that question needs to be harmonized with what is the vision from the commercial point of view. So in the medical affairs department uh, of competence seems to me the most um, um, appropriate home. Great. Well, Ricardo, I just wanted to say thank you very much for your, your time and your insights today. It's been really interesting. Um, and I know you're presenting on this subject at a forthcoming conference, so I'm sure that will be very well received. Thank you. Thank you very much.